Welcome to chapter 13, looking at the judiciary. What do you know about the judicial branch as we look at this chapter overview from the chapter notes? Pause the video and take a look at these questions and see what you can answer. Better yet, uh, do this again at the end of the chapter. Uh, I've got another slide on this at the very end for you to check your work and see, uh, can I answer them now in terms of what I know about the judicial branch? Glad you're here and I hope you find this helpful. First, we start by looking at Article 3 of the Constitution, which is focused on the judiciary, the idea of judicial power, uh, looking at the power vested in a Supreme Court and inferior courts that Congress can establish and has been established through the Judiciary Act of 1789. Uh, the judges in the federal bench serve for life. Uh, they are subject to good behavior, mind you, uh, and Congress uh, can set the number of justices on the Supreme Court, but um, cannot otherwise meddle in what the Supreme Court uh, is doing in terms of declaring um, items, uh, in, ter in terms of granting writ of certiorari, uh, basically uh, uh, granting appeals to hear cases, or in terms of uh, setting precedent or declaring um, judicial review, the, the idea of constitutionality or unconstitutionality. But Congress can set uh, and create and uh, change uh, the lower courts from time to time. So they can determine how many people sit on the court. Um, we've heard a lot in the election year about packing the court um, and kind of a moot point now uh, looking at um, how close the Senate is, but, uh, but the idea is um, that the Congress can set the number of justices that sit on the Supreme Court, just like they can determine uh, the jurisdictions or the areas uh, that the, uh, the federal courts, the, those circuit courts, think of them like the, the semifinals um, of the playoff of the, uh, the, the uh, playoff games, if you will. Um, they can uh, set the um, jurisdiction and the number of, of judges that serve on those federal panels or those what we call circuits um, and and the Congress is what sets the laws for that and determines that according to the Constitution now the Judiciary Act of 1789 is kind of the fallback that is really what Congress did initially and Congress has changed from time to time pieces of the Judiciary Act uh, but that uh, largely remains in place today in terms of setting uh, the standards for the federal judiciary uh, those uh, circuit courts that ultimately a uh, case could be appealed to the Supreme Court we're going to take a look at the judicial branch first. Uh, let's start by looking at the history. It's important to note that the framers really viewed the judicial branch and the judiciary as an important check. Uh, and, uh, and this idea uh, of um, having the court step in to determine if something that is being taken or something being done, an action being taken, uh, is unconstitutional. Uh, we look at the Muslim ban that President Trump uh, use an executive order to try and institute uh, shortly after taking office in 2017. Uh, the court stepped in and said this was unconstitutional. Uh, and then coming back uh, on a number of issues and determining uh, other items were unconstitutional. So uh, this is an important check on the other branches. Likewise, the court also can step in when a when a law is made and, and uh, pa passed by Congress, signed by the president, uh, they can step in and say that that is unconstitutional, and they have uh, when it came to gun laws, when it came to uh, granting the president the right of a line item veto, Clinton v. City of New York. Um, the president signed it, the, the Congress passed it, the president signed it, and the court declared it unconstitutional. Um, so um, this is an important check seen by the framers as uh, as checking or, or making keeping the other branches in line. Uh, they also wanted them to be insulated from public opinion uh, or outcry. Uh, and especially from uh, other parts of government. And so they really made them serve for life uh, so that they wouldn't uh, have to worry about running for office or being reelected uh, or having to worry about what was going on in the public opinion at the time or even in other parts of government at the time. Uh, so this is important because uh, that insulation is going to help them uh, to do their jobs better in terms of looking at the Constitution and what it actually says and how they're interpreting it based on the current laws, actions, executive orders, and other uh, agreements or treaties uh, that are being passed uh, by the executive branch as well as uh, by Congress. Now, uh, the federal courts uh, do establish uh, or exercise this idea of, of judicial review, and it comes from uh, this initial case, Marbury versus Madison in 1803. 
Now, up to this point, the courts really didn't step in on constitutional issues. Um, that it really was um, uh, more or less a passive organization. What you saw with this court, uh, with the um, the court here, was uh, with the Marshall Court, was uh, looking at Marbury versus Madison. Uh, John Marshall. Uh, basically took a much more proactive role in um, in looking at the constitutionality of laws and, and uh, executive orders or treaties, other actions that the government was taking. This is a situation where um, Marbury uh, basically was given a um, an appointment or knew he was going to be getting an appointment by John Adams uh, to uh, to serve in the in the uh, court system, and. Um, uh, I think it was a justice of the peace in some capacity. And um, this this order, though, was never given. This appointment was never given to Marbury. And uh, so it was on the desk of the Secretary of State at the time. And uh, with the, the uh, changing of the guard from John Adams as president to uh, Thomas Jefferson as president, Madison comes in as the new Secretary of State. And on his desk are these items to uh, to deliver to the, these, these midnight appointments uh, that took place right before uh, Adams left office. Office. And so Madison says to Jefferson, what should I do about these? And he's like, I think you should just disregard them. And so Madison did. And Marbury sued and said, uh, that appointment was, was given to me. I don't have it physically yet, but um, I was told I was getting it. And just because you didn't deliver doesn't make it uh, real. Um, and so this case went to court. And uh, the Supreme Court looked at this case under Marshall and said, uh, and Jefferson was really kind of uh, hedging about whether or not he wanted the courts to get involved in this because he really didn't see them as having this role of, of exercising more judicial review uh, and the constitutionality of these types of issues. Um, but in this case, um, the court stepped in and said, um, there are a couple of things we need to look at here. One, do we have the power to determine whether this is constitutional? And secondly, uh, does Marbury get this appointment uh, or, or you know, was Madison in the right? And so uh, they did both of these. They looked at the, the idea of constitutionality and said, uh, this, is a, this is a situation where the courts should step in and should determine whether the executive branch was right or wrong. Uh, and, um, and so they did step in. They looked at the case and they said uh, that Madison, uh, under his taking his orders from his chief, which was Jefferson uh, as president, um, he did the right thing. And Marbury wasn't supposed to be granted this under writ of mandamus, the idea that the court would tell uh, a branch of government to, uh, to carry out these actions. Um, and, uh, and so Marbury lost his, his appointment uh, and uh, Madison... Uh, won, well, ultimately, Jefferson won the case. Uh, Jefferson, of course, a, a very mixed emotional victory because while he uh, won the battle, he lost the war, so to speak. Uh, he won the battle and then he won the case against Marbury uh, and he didn't have to deliver the appointments. But he lost the war in that um, now the Supreme Court did establish they had the right uh, to review the constitutionality of issues uh, and that included laws, that included executive orders, that included uh, treaties, other actions that the executive branch may be taking, uh, rules and whatnot, uh, that we talked about in the last chapter in the bureaucracy. And, um, and in this sense, uh, they would be all over Jefferson's business as president. And so uh, he looked at it as uh, kind of losing the war, even though we won the battle. Uh, so now the courts would continue to step in and rule on the constitutionality. And it really did strengthen the judiciary. It really did change the game. And really put the judicial branch on the map in terms of what they could and couldn't do. Now, keep in mind that judicial review isn't mentioned in the Constitution. It has been an accepted practice since the days of Marbury and since the Marshall Court um, in terms of stepping in on the types of things we talked about uh, just a moment ago, this idea of any federal laws uh, that have been passed, um, other executive actions and orders, as well as state laws or administrative laws, any treaties, uh, any other actions that the uh, federal government or the uh, bureaucracy through the executive branch may take. And they can overturn those. They can determine if they violate the Constitution, they will be declared unconstitutional. And it's essentially uh, as uh, taking a delete button to those items, uh, they no longer exist. Uh, and, and according to the Supreme Court, uh, if that rule is upheld, uh, meaning if they keep that ruling uh, through the courts of the appeals process, if it makes it all the way to the Supreme Court and, and is upheld, or if the Supreme Court agrees not to see it, which means uh, that they would be uh, agreeing with the lower court ruling and that lower court ruling would stand, um, they can essentially wipe uh, those, uh, due to constitutionality, they can wipe those off the map. 
and that uh, is essentially the judicial review that we see today. Now, a lot of this uh, was outlined uh, in trying to get the Constitution ratified uh, by Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 78. Uh, in this, he looks at uh, the power of the judicial branch, the importance of their role in terms of um, in, in terms of the uh, the third branch checking the others uh, by uh, by determining uh, constitutionality of um, and again doesn't go into detail in terms of the uh, judicial review process but in terms of uh, in terms of being that check on the executive and uh, legislative branches uh, so you can see um, a couple of things that he argued here, uh, one, that the uh, judiciary should serve for life, they should have lifetime tenure, and the reason for that is to take them out of the political process so that they serve for life, they don't switch and become uh, running for president or become politicians uh, running for Congress, and also so that they can focus on the law, they can focus on the Constitution, constitutional law, and focus on their their role as uh, this idea of judicial review or, or the constitutionality uh, of laws and acts and, and actions that are passed by the government and and, and uh, implemented by the government. So uh, he outlines all of this in Federalist 78. Uh, if you check the chapter notes, uh, the link down here where it says Federalist 78 explained, this is an explainer, um, which uh, is from Hip Hughes, which does a really good job in explaining Federalist 78. I would encourage you to watch that one. Uh, and again, there's a lot of other ones out there, but uh, that was one I, I picked up on. Um, uh, Carrie LaManna has another one here on uh, Federalist 78 that uh, in terms of what you need to know for the AP exam, uh, Hip Hughes, I think, does uh, as good, if not better, a job on this one in particular. And then also one on Marbury versus Madison. Again, uh, in the chapter notes, all of these are links, so I would encourage you to check those out. Okay, uh, so um, in terms of review, again, you can pause the video here and take a look. If you don't understand something, uh, that, that you can't answer a question that's here, you might want to go back and watch uh, the video again for this particular section. As for us, we're going to continue moving, and we're going into 2.9 now, which is the legitimacy of the judicial branch. So let's take a look at uh, what we're looking at here. Uh, it is a dual court structure. We have a state court system. We have a federal court system. And uh, the only time the uh, state court, uh, appellate court, would be overruled is if they were appealing it to the Supreme Court. Uh, and again, that doesn't happen often. Uh, it does happen, uh, but it doesn't happen often. It, it's not a regular occurrence that this would be the that this would be the case. So as a dual court structure. They are separate jurisdictions in terms of the roles that they play here. Uh, and judges, by the way, don't go looking for cases. Um, they, cases come to them. Uh, so they're only looking at, um, you may recall um, a news article recently uh, where um, Justice Alito and Justices Thomas, uh, the associate justices on the U.S. Supreme Court, said they were looking at a case uh, that, would, um, that would look at the in Institute of, uh, of Marriage uh, and they were looking for cases uh, in, in not in so many words, but but kind of reading between the lines. That was kind of what the article, I think it was in Politico, that, that talked about this. Uh, but typically, judges don't go looking for cases. Now, that's a unique situation we haven't seen very often. And obviously, it made a lot of press because of the fact that um, you don't usually hear justices talking like that. Um, in today's day and age, usually uh, they wait for the, the cases to come to them. Um, but uh, remember, the idea here is there is some limit to their judicial power. They can rule on the constitutionality of this, uh, but they can't make up the cases. Uh, they, they can't uh, get the cases um, to come to them. They have to, they have to rule and, and decide and, um, and look at what is coming before them. And, uh, and again, there's no problem until somebody makes it a problem. So they also have to have standing to sue, which we'll talk about a little later. But um, if someone is suing, like we saw with this Texas case against President Trump or against the, uh, the states that were, that were basically voting against President Trump in the Electoral College uh, in the swing states uh, that were very, very close, um, the states were suing and the Supreme Court uh, basically ruled on Friday evening to throw out that case. Um, and the reason was because they said that Texas didn't have standing to sue, meaning that they weren't irreparably harmed by uh, the 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 um, uh, what they were suing about with those four states, and therefore uh, they had no they had no ability to be able to stand before the court and say this is uh, this is what we're concerned about. So um, standing is very important here, and a lot of cases get thrown out because uh, they look at uh, the standing to sue and say you have no standing in our court, uh, you really have no standing. They're not even ruling on the constitutionality of the issue because they haven't even gotten that far. Uh, you ha there has to be someone who is, has been irreparably uh, harmed in, in some way, shape or form, mentally, physically, emotionally, um, financially, economically. Um, 
and uh, and that would give them cause uh, to have standing to sue. But uh, in a lot of these cases, we don't see that that is happening. So we have two court systems, essentially. Uh, the federal court, and we'll go into more detail on this, but the idea is you would start in a district court. Uh, we have a district courthouse in Rockville, uh, Maryland, and that would be where your case would start if it were moving through the uh, federal court system. It would go to the Circuit Courts of Appeals, uh, which is down in Richmond, uh, which is part of the Fourth Circuit, uh, and then it would be appealed to the Supreme Court. So that's in the federal system. In the state system, you would start in uh, a municipal court. Uh, again, uh, you would probably start in uh, in Rockville in that particular case. Uh, you would go to a tri trial court, which also would be in Rockville, an intermediate court, um, and then uh, which would probably be somewhere um, uh, within the county or within um, the state and uh, probably in Annapolis. And then the appeals court, the appellate court of last resort, uh, would be the Supreme Court uh, within um, Maryland, and that's in Annapolis as well, um, just um, about a half a mile from the uh, General Assembly building, the State House in, in Annapolis. Uh, so uh, the types of courts we're looking at here, the court of original jurisdiction in most cases is what we call uh, a trial court. Um, and uh, what you're gonna see here is they decide guilt or innocence. Uh, if you're not guilty, you are innocent. Uh, if you are guilty, it means that the court has found that there is enough evidence to convict you of uh, whatever it is you're being accused of, okay? Um, and these are usually in uh, criminal trials that we would see this. And um, and again, you're deciding guilt or innocence. Uh, a district court would be a good example here of a trial court where you would see this playing out. Uh, an appellate court uh, would not have a jury. Uh, you wouldn't be uh, deciding on... Um, the uh, uh, the guilt or innocence, you'd be deciding on whether the rules were followed. Uh, were the rules followed in those particular cases? Um, did that person have standing to sue uh, in that particular sense? And um, and uh, was the was the law followed? And we'll look at this um, coming up in the uh, in the next unit on civil rights and civil liberties. Um, was the law followed in terms of the Fourteenth Amendment, equal protection, um, uh, equal protection clause of the uh, uh, or the uh, procedural um, aspects of of due process? Were those followed uh, in in, um, in the courts in terms of all of the procedures and and the, the policies followed in terms of how this court played out. Uh, so the appellate jurisdiction, uh, the Supreme Court is one of those. We also see here in the, the, the boundary map, uh, you can see the fourth district, which is uh, which will include Maryland as well as Virginia, the Carolinas, and West Virginia. Um, and um, that would be our court of appellate jurisdiction, our appellate court in Richmond um, that would, that would uh, be at work here. But the idea is an appeals court is not going to determine guilt or innocence. They're looking at if the court followed the rules, if, uh, the, uh, if there is any, um, any concerns about how uh, the, the case was pursued and how the case uh, found this person guilty. Uh, they're not going to look at the guilt or innocence per se. They're going to look at the procedures the policies, uh, the standing, and um, and make a determination on constitutionality here as well. And the Supreme Court is a great example of that. The circuits that you see here are also examples of those appellate courts. The federal court system, as I mentioned, uh, starts with that trial court. Uh, again, we have one in in um, uh, excuse me in Rockville, uh, Maryland, and uh, that big uh, kind of uh, round in the front uh, shaped building that you see there uh, is uh, the uh, Richmond or the um, excuse me the Rockville courthouse uh, and that's in the district court uh, the appellate court would be the one in Richmond and then the Supreme Court would be the one in Washington DC across from the Capitol in terms of what we see there so original jurisdiction is the first court that's going to hear a case that's usually going to be in a district court uh, on the federal court level you're not going to go right to an appeals court you would start in a trial court first uh, and then from there in that district court, you would move up uh, to appellate jurisdiction. That's where they're going to hear your appeal. They're going to determine based on either legal issues, procedural, that due process I was talking about, or constitutional ones. Uh, was it constitutional for them to do this? Uh, they're going to look at that as well. Again, original jurisdiction is going to be a district court in terms of those uh, federal cases. Um, you're going to see that in uh, Rockville and, then, uh, and, and in 93 other judicial districts across the country. Uh, the Circuit Court of Appeals would be those 12 regional circuits we saw on the map on the last slide, and those are the ones that um, they will take and hear your case. If they decide that, one, uh, there's not really a constitutional issue here, or um, 
you uh, th there's there's uh, we we don't disagree with what the trial court has done in the district court, uh, then they're not going to hear the case. And in most cases, that is what happens. Uh, they agree uh, that they agree with the lower court ruling, and uh, they would not hear the case. Uh, so essentially, uh, they're issuing what's called stare decisis. Uh, let the decision stand. It's basically rejection of your appeal and of the lower court ruling would stand as it as it is. Uh, and that's what we see there. Uh, so after the Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, then you would go to the Supreme Court. That is the, uh, the, the law of the land. The buck stops here. Uh, they are the final word on a case. And if they don't agree to hear your case, which uh, more than likely they will not, uh, remember thousands of cases are appealed to the Supreme Court each year. Only a couple hundred are even heard. Uh, and of those, uh, many of them are not overturned. Uh, so um, the idea there is uh, the likelihood of seeing your case overturned by the Supreme Court is a very, very small percentage in terms of what we see here. Again, the boundaries on the circuit courts, uh, the courts of appeals, uh, these would be after the district court, after the Rockville courthouse, you would appeal to the fourth circuit. Uh, if you were in one of these other districts, you would be appealing to their circuits. Uh, and as you can see, based on the part of the country they're in, some are more liberal or more conservative, more progressive or more uh, conservative than you would see in, in different places uh, based on those circuits. Um, they have changed. And again, um, the uh, Congress is uh, who determines the boundaries of those courts of appeals and what they look like. It was originally the the uh, uh, the Judiciary Act of 1789 that established these. So you can see the first, second, third, fourth are much smaller uh, districts uh, in terms of those courts of appeals uh, in their circuits. Sorry, not districts uh, in their circuits. Um, and then expanding on that, Congress as the country grew, Congress changed uh, or modified the Judiciary Act to include new states and new circuits as part of, of that expansion. Uh, and so that we can see playing out here in the, the boundaries. Now, uh, let's talk about the Justice Department because it's overseen by an attorney general, not a secretary, uh, which we talked about before. Uh, the attorney general right now is William Barr. Uh, and until January 20th, uh, he is responsible for um, basically overseeing uh, what the government does, uh, both in um, prosecuting cases as well as in defending lawsuits against the United States. So he is uh, the, uh, the lead attorney, if you will, for the United States. Uh, he also has a, a deputy attorney general and a solicitor general, which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, there are 94 U.S. attorneys in those 94 districts across the country. Uh, they serve as, as uh, U.S. attorneys uh, working for the Justice Department. They have staffs as well, and they are the ones that will represent the U.S. government in those districts when a case comes up uh, that is of concern to that district. Um, in having to do with the federal government. Many times it is the federal government that is doing the suing, uh, and so it is those U.S. attorneys that are that are appearing in a courtroom or before a judge and asking uh, for a particular situation. Many of them like cease and desist orders, uh, things like getting a company to stop doing something. That's a cease and desist order. Stop doing this. Um, or, um, or they didn't uh, comply with the law. So again, trying to uh, enforce regulate, regulations. Uh, remember those regulatory commissions? Well, they're going to get the Justice Department involved to help uh, with, with prosecuting and enforcing the law in those aspects. And it's these uh, U.S. attorneys, the district attorneys that we see in these 94 districts uh, that are going to help uh, the different uh, uh, regulatory commissions with that. Uh, the Solicitor General, as I mentioned, uh, that we that we see here, the Solicitor General is in charge of um, of, of essentially arguing the cases before the court, uh, the Supreme Court in particular, and uh, representing the U.S. government in that capacity, more in a defense mechanism than than prosecution. Deputy Attorney General usually does that, uh, or they're looking at in the um, in the districts, the U.S. attorneys in those districts would do that. Uh, but in terms of the Supreme Court, it is the Solicitor General that would take that on. And the idea here is um, the, the current Solicitor General is an acting Solicitor General. This is Jeff Wall. Um, he is, again, representing uh, the United States government before the court. And um, he took that role in June of 2020 
uh, when Noel Francisco, who was the uh, former Solicitor General, uh, stepped down from that role. And so uh, he is in an acting uh, role as Solicitor General and will be until uh, the end of the Trump administration and, the, and the, uh, whoever the new Solicitor General is uh, in that capacity under the Biden administration, the President-elect Biden. So we'll see. To be continued, we'll see what happens there. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, we don't have a current picture. I wish we did. Uh, but uh, they haven't sat down for the official photo since Amy Coney Barrett uh, joined them in office. Uh, they usually do that in the fall at the beginning of their session. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, in October and uh, the replacement of her with Amy Coney Barrett, who's pictured down there with President Trump, uh, just before the election, uh, they haven't had a chance to have that photo yet. So um, that will be forthcoming. Uh, but uh, the idea here is... Uh, that we have the nine justices, kind of, sort of, at least on the page, uh, in, in their terms. Um, let's start down in the uh, lower left-hand corner with uh, Justice Stephen Breyer. He was appointed by President Bill Clinton um, and, um, and from Massachusetts, uh, serving as a judge there, I believe. Uh, Clarence Thomas uh, is uh, the, the second from the left, and he was appointed by George Herbert Walker Bush, George uh, Bush 41, um, and... Um, a, uh, and is the longest serving on the court right now uh, is Justice Thomas. So having served uh, since, um, I guess that would have been uh, 91, uh, 91, or 1991, somewhere around in there. Um, in the middle, uh, we have Justice Roberts. He is the Chief Justice. Uh, he was appointed by George W. Bush, uh, which is Bush 43, the 43rd president. Uh, he was appointed to the court. He was originally appointed for Sandra Day O'Connor's seat, uh, and as they were beginning to go through that process, uh, the Chief Justice William Rehnquist, who had throat cancer, uh, he actually passed away, and Bush rescinded his uh, his nomination to Sandra Day O'Connor's seat, uh, which is uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, and actually nominated him for Chief Justice. So um, he has um, he has served in that role uh, since uh, the George W. Bush administration. Um, and uh, then, as I mentioned, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, was appointed by President Bill Clinton. Uh, in the in uh, 1993, 94, somewhere around in there, and um, the idea is uh, that uh, she was on the court, um, one of the longest serving behind uh, Justice Thomas, but um, she passed away in October, and um, and Amy Coney Barrett uh, was nominated by uh, President Trump and uh, and approved by the Senate uh, to fill her uh, to fill her seat. So she is now in that role. Uh, the last one on the front row is Sam Alito. Uh, he is in Sandra Day O'Connor's old seat. Uh, this was the one that John Roberts was appointed to uh, previously. And um, and then uh, when Rehnquist, the Chief Justice, passed away, Roberts was uh, nominated to that seat. So uh, Sam Alito was appointed uh, by uh, George W. Bush as well, Bush 43, uh, in that role. And again, that was uh, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female uh, justice on the court. Uh, that was her seat. Uh, notice the longest serving justices, other than the Chief Justice, the longest serving justices are seated. Um, and the ones that have served the longest uh, will sit closest to the Chief Justice. Uh, and then from there, they will branch out based on, on tenure, based on their, their years of service. Uh, you'll also see that on the court that way. Um, when they're seated in the uh, Supreme Court's chambers, uh, they are seated, those that are uh, the Chief Justice in the middle, and then those that are, have served the longest will be seated closest to him. And then um, those that are... Um, have served less time will be further out. So uh, the newest members on the are on the very ends of uh, of the uh, the nine that sit on the bench uh, in terms of what you see there. Now in the back row, uh, starting from left to right, uh, left we have Neil Gorsuch. Uh, he was the first uh, uh, justice appointed by President Trump um, when President Trump came into office, um, and this. Uh, you may recall was um, uh, Antonin Scalia's seat uh, that was uh, nominated by uh, Merrick Garland was nominated by President Obama. The seat was held open until after the election, um, and then uh, President Trump won that election instead of Hillary Clinton. And so um, uh, the Merrick Garland uh, never got a hearing uh, in the Senate, uh, 
on that role, uh, saying uh, the, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell saying at the time that uh, we needed to have an election so that the people could decide. Uh, so Neil Gorsuch was named to that seat. By the way, one of the first calls he made was to Merrick Garland uh, to talk with him. Obviously, no hard feelings between the two of them. It wasn't up to them uh, in terms of that. So uh, we see that kind of playing out. Uh, next, we have Sonia Sotomayor, uh, the first Latina uh, uh, who was named to the court uh, by President Obama. Uh, that was his first nomination. Uh, to the court, and uh, having met her, very nice. She um, uh, was uh, a, a very cordial and very uh, uh, respectful of, uh, of government teachers, so that was kind of exciting to hear. Um, she was uh, she was really nice about it, and um, and was like, "Whoa, you you're here at this reception. You you have to get up early, don't you?" And I was like, "Yeah, this was this was a couple of years ago." Uh, but anyway, um, very nice lady, and um, so she was uh, President Obama's first nominee to the court, and um, and as and the first. Latina, as I mentioned, um, uh, to the court as well. Uh, next, we have Elena Kagan. This was uh, President Obama's second nomination uh, to the court. Uh, she worked with uh, President Obama when he was a professor at the University of Chicago, a uh, constitutional law professor, and that's where he worked with Kagan, who was a, a professor of constitutional law at the time uh, there. She also served as Solicitor General. You may, uh, I mentioned Jeff Wall earlier. Uh, she served in his role as Solicitor General before she was uh, named to this top job. So um, when Obama first came to office, uh, he had appointed her as Solicitor General um, through his relationship with her at the University of Chicago and then ultimately to the court. And uh, by the way, uh, in meeting her at the uh, the street law event uh, teacher um, fellowship program I did a couple summers ago, um, it was neat uh, that she has two brothers that are also social studies teachers. So she was very into talking to social studies teachers, which was really nice uh, and um, and helpful. And then uh, the newest member of the court before Amy Coney Barrett uh, was Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, you may remember the Kavanaugh hearings uh, were uh, uh, were pretty controversial uh, because of some allegations um, that were um, leveled against him and um, and were heard before the Judiciary Committee at the time. Um, and so he was the second nominee to the court by President Trump and the third one, obviously, uh, to replace Ginsburg uh, with Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, so this is the these are the nine. This is the U.S. Supreme Court that we have in 2020 uh, that we see today. Now, uh, let's talk about the Supreme Court for a second. Uh, they get to choose the cases they hear. Now, they're going to get thousands of appeals, OK, um, and uh, thousands of appeals over the course of a year, and they're only going to decide, they're only going to agree to hear a couple hundred of them. They may only decide cases that actually move the needle, actually change what the appellate court said um, uh, marginally. Uh, not all of those cases are going to be overturned, but uh, they get to choose which cases. So this is where cases come to them. Uh, they don't go out and seek cases. Uh, the caseload is determined by, by what they want to hear. Uh, this is the idea, what we call the rule of four. Uh, if four of the justices uh, want to hear cases, uh, four of the nine, uh, then they will agree to what we call grant writ of certiorari. Granting writ of certiorari basically is Latin for uh, show me the documents, show me the papers uh, for the case, we want to hear the case. And so that is what they do. Now, keep in mind um, that uh, in this capacity, uh, they will only hear about 70 to 80 cases a year. Uh, they will hear a lot of um, additional cases that may be added to this caseload um, in terms of what they're hearing here. And about 99%, remember I said thousands of cases are appealed, uh, but the idea is they're going to reject most of those because they either, they either agree with the lower court ruling uh, in, in a majority sense, uh, because again, you only need four people uh, to agree to, to hear the case, uh, but many of them, and, and I would say most uh, of the time, uh, they're going to agree on the constitutional basis of the cases that they're hearing. Okay, so rule of four, very important here. Uh, this is the idea that you need four of the nine judges to agree to hear the case, and granting that writ of certiorari is essentially uh, granting the request to hear the appeal. OK, so they're going to ask for those lower court documents. Many of these caseloads, by the way, uh, they don't have standing to sue. So the Supreme Court steps in and says, we don't even think you have standing to sue in this case. Uh, and it's basically issuing kind of a slap on the wrist to the uh, appellate court saying, why didn't you catch this? Why didn't you say, hey, you guys don't have standing to sue here. What are you doing? Throw that case out. Uh, why did it get all the way to us? Um, which is essentially uh, what they're trying to tell the appellate courts 
in terms of what we see there. And again, writ of certiorari is only if the, uh, the Supreme Court is agreeing to hear the case, that rule of four. Otherwise, they would uh, issue stare decisis, stand the decision. It is Latin for stand the decision, meaning uh, let the lower court's decision stand because we don't want anything to do with it. Uh, we're going we're gonna to agree with the lower court there. We don't even need to hear the case. And that's what we're going to see in this, this capacity. Now, as I mentioned, um, you can see here with the Roberts Court, uh, who appointed them, how old they are. Um, we have uh, some justices that are, um, are, are younger than they used to be. We used to have a, a septuagenarian uh, societal uh, Supreme Court here. Um, the, the numbers have dropped uh, since we uh, included people like Elena Kagan and Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, the youngest, um, uh, and, and going to be on the cart for a long, long time based on that, that age number um, in terms of what we see here. Uh, on the other end, we see you know Clarence Thomas and Stephen Breyer uh, being uh, the um, longest serving now on the court. Um, and so they are um, they're getting up there. Uh, Thomas, 70, uh, not as old as, as, uh, as some of the ones we've seen in terms of the courts. Uh, so he's uh, not necessarily looking to, to step down anytime soon, I don't think. Uh, but, uh, but we can see that the court is, uh, is shifting to a younger age bracket. And these people are going to be on the court for a long time. Uh, so in looking at these ages, uh, you can see that uh, this is going to outlive the presidencies of the individuals that appoint them. This is going to be one of the most important decisions that they make as president because it is going to uh, last longer than them. Uh, and what we can see here is that it definitely does. George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, he's, he's passed away now, uh, but he appointed, made that appointment 30 years ago. Uh, and that appointment is still on the court. Clarence Thomas still there 30 years later. So you can see how long your legacy lives on in terms of uh, your appointment to the court, you can see how important the decision is to be made here. And, uh, and that definitely uh, is an important one. Uh, in certain terms of some qualifications, um, there's no formal qualification. Uh, many times they're looking for people that have a law background or some type of uh, legal uh, I, uh, legal aspects to their, their cases, uh, many of them serving as judges. Uh, I mentioned Elena Kagan serving as a constitutional law professor. Uh, then she was solicitor general. She never served on a, uh, on a court, um, and she is unique in that respect. Uh, we saw uh, O'Connor, uh, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor there on the left, uh, who was the first female uh, associate justice to the court named by uh, President Ronald Reagan. Um, and uh, she was a, a judge on a lower court. Uh, with Sonia Sotomayor was also a uh, judge on a circuit court. And uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a, a, a judge on a the federal circuit in Washington. Um, and so uh, you don't necessarily have to be a judge serving on those courts, as I mentioned with Kagan. Uh, she was a law professor, then solicitor general, uh, and that qualified her enough to be appointed by President Obama. Uh, so the judicial experience is important in some capacity, uh, but there's not a formal qualification in terms of doing so. And again, they serve for Life. So the check here is that the Senate uh, would approve their nomination uh, to the court. Now, senatorial courtesy is the idea that not Supreme Court level, but anything beneath Supreme Court level, so circuits or districts, um, uh, the appointments to the federal or the circuit courts um, or the the, uh, the district courts that we see there uh, would be appointed by the president and the president would consult with senators on those nominations from their states. OK, uh, now this is also seen as something that a president would do with senators of his own party. Um, he's not going to uh, extend this courtesy uh, outside of his own uh, outside of his own party. Uh, that used to be the case. That is not so much anymore. Uh, this senatorial courtesy has kind of uh, become more partisan as has in everything uh, in terms of that aspect. Uh, so that is a little different there. But senatorial courtesy is the idea uh, we used to call it the blue slips, uh, the idea that um, you put on a blue slip the names of, of people you're, con you're interested in considering uh, to get a, a thumbs up or thumbs down from the senators from those states as to whether they would be good candidates. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, usually they'd get a thumbs up kind of thing unless there was a major obstacle or impediment that would be uh, blocking their, um, their nomination. So in selecting judges, uh, we mentioned the Sotomayor um, uh, situation. Uh, the Senate is confirming them. So uh, again, this is going to be the president's most important and most lasting uh, decision that they make. Um, a lot of what they do 
uh, last throughout their term and, and term of office and maybe a few years after, uh, if a bill is named after them, like Obamacare, for instance, um, you see that as being a lasting influence. But the, but the, the uh, Supreme Court is a big one in that uh, the people you name to that court, I mean, poor Jimmy Carter, uh, you know, he served for four years. And you want to talk about a difference between Donald Trump and Jimmy Carter in terms of their four years. Jimmy Carter served for four years and didn't get one nomination and uh, didn't have one opportunity to name a judge uh, to the to the uh, Supreme Court, uh, to federal courts, yes. Um, and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg to the federal court was one of the ones he nominated. Uh, but uh, Donald Trump, on the other hand, uh, in office four years and nominated three justices to the court. Uh, so you can see the difference. Um, it is all dependent on the, how the dice rolls, uh, so to speak. Uh, so some factors that the, the president would consider in terms of these judges. Uh, party ID is important. Um, you know, you can't step up here and say that, that they're not members of a particular party or a particular ideological viewpoints. Uh, of course they are. Uh, and you can't look at that and say they're not. Um, uh, that ideology is important in addition to their party ID. Uh, their judicial philosophy, how do they believe uh, in terms of interpreting the Constitution and uh, and the role that the, the judicial branch plays in that capacity, as well as their qualifications. Uh, what have they done up to this point that has helped to prove that? And they have a track record, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, uh, but they have a, a, a paper trail uh, that shows us uh, how they believe what they believe, and especially in today's day and age with social media and and um, and a really good national archive system. It's very easy uh, to keep track of, of all of the uh, things that they have done, what they have written, uh, what they have uh, commented on, uh, cases they've dissented or they've written the, uh, uh, the majority opinion. All of those types of things are, are really important and they follow them wherever they go. So, and they know this uh, because uh, when people are looking on behalf of the president for these nominees, they're reading all of their stuff and they're reading all of the things that they've said all along the way in order to make a determination as to whether they, you know, they, they are okay or there's something in, in their uh, skeletal closet, so to speak, uh, that is of concern that would, that would keep a president from nominating them uh, and, and, and cause uh, problems in the Senate confirmation process. Uh, their age is also an important factor. You don't want to nominate someone who's really old, is only going to be on the court for a couple of years, uh, because again, that uh, really mutes your legacy. The younger you can uh, add them to the court, uh, the more successful they will be in implementing uh, your philosophy and your uh, your point of view uh, for a long term uh, for a long term of the court. And don't kid yourself, President Trump knows this in the people that he selected. Amy Coney Barrett being 48 years old, a very young age to be on the court, um, she's going to be there a long time. And he knows this, uh, which is why he selected people that were very young. Uh, and then gender. Obviously uh, important to President Trump to nominate a woman to that role, uh, serving in um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's old seat, uh, to nominate a woman to that role, the importance of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and all that she did uh, along the lines for women's issues and wanting to nominate a woman to that role. So gender plays a role there as well. The last one is race. Uh, and uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, in looking at this, um, uh, in nominating Clarence Thomas uh, to what was uh, Thurgood Marshall's seat uh, on the court, uh, knew this and and wanted um, to uh, nominate a conservative African American to the to the court in that capacity. Uh, President Obama did the same thing with nominating Sonia Sotomayor uh, in looking at uh, the role that she played in a Latina, the first Latina female on the court, and really in the role uh, that she would serve for many many years to come. So uh, we uh, don't see as much of these anymore because we don't have a lot of recesses, but recess appointments are when uh, the president is going to nominate a judge while Congress is recessed. Now, like I said, we don't see many recess appointments anymore, but most of these are going to be for the... Um, are going to be for the federal circuits uh, along the way. We saw Reagan do a lot of this during recess, again, because uh, he knew he couldn't get nominations through a Democratic Senate at the time in terms of uh, nominating. Uh, and again, uh, the Senate may not confirm them, so a recess appointment is a great way to go. Now, there are a lot of political, or sorry, some um, uh, policy maneuvers, parliamentary maneuvers that um, uh, the uh, Senate can use in order to stay in session so they're not in recess, which wouldn't allow a president to be able to uh, make those appointments. And that's why we've seen a lot of those, uh, a, a, a much smaller amount made during the uh, Obama years. Um, uh, also to keep, important to keep in mind that they don't serve uh, for life in this capacity because they're a recess appointment. They serve for a year and then they have to be conserve, uh, confirmed by the Senate in a um, 
in, in order to be stay in that position. So um, it's kind of a moot point in a lot of cases. Uh, you want to confirm them in, in order to get them in there. Um, and again, you'd have to be in recess to do it. So uh, if if Congress isn't in recess and there's no appointment available, it's really hard to, to uh, make that appointment. Uh, it's near impossible to make that appointment. Uh, and so we see this time and again. Um, Let's uh, turn now to the court in action. Let's see actually how that plays out in terms of what they do. Um, the court is more likely to hear a case if two or more circuits are ruling differently, if there's conflict on this particular issue. Also, if the federal government is, is going to petition the case, uh, they're weighing in, putting their thumb on the scale. We're going to see um, some action by the court as a result of that. Uh, if the case presents a civil rights or civil liberties question uh, that is constitutional, uh, constitutional question related to civil rights or civil liberties, this is going to be a situation in which the court steps in on. Uh, if there's a political or social interest uh, that is rather significant that the court wants to weigh in on, again, you need four of the nine members to do so um, this is a uh, idea of just justiciable disputes um, is this something that can actually be decided by a court is it a constitutional question not a political question and many cases that are brought before the court or or get to this level um, again it's kind of a hand slap to the uh, to the circuit courts uh, but many times they'll say this is a it, this is not a justiciable dispute uh, this is a political question that Congress should be addressing not a constitutional one that the court should be addressing and that is significant uh, because uh, basically what that means is Congress you're not doing your job and appe appeals court appellate courts aren't doing uh, their job by by uh, sending this over to uh, to Congress to take care of and, and, and saying, hey, we're not ruling on this. Uh, standing is another important aspect that is important here. Do the people have standing to sue? Are you allowed to take the case to court? Are you able to show that you've been harmed as a result of this process? If you can't, you don't have standing to sue. This was the case that was ruled on Friday night by the court. Uh, that basically said Texas, uh, t Texas's attorney general, did not have standing to sue uh, the, the states of Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia uh, because they didn't have standing to show that they were actually harmed as a result of this process. Uh, so if they don't have standing to sue, the, the courts will throw them out. Uh, justiciable disputes, again, this idea that you can actually decide something uh, in terms of what's what harm has been taken place. And again, if you don't have standing to sue, then it's not a justiciable dispute. Uh, so do I have the right to file a pharmaceutical injury case or to join a pharmaceutical class action lawsuit? Well, if I don't, uh, and I don't have any harm, I can't show any harm that has been done, then I don't have standing to sue. And maybe it's a question that this is a political one. Gerrymandering, they looked at and said, uh, we're not going to get involved in this because it's not a justiciable dispute. It's a political question. And that political question, we're not going to get involved with because that's not something we should be addressing. So they quickly um, put a kibosh to that and said, hey, this is something uh, that the Congress, that the legislative branch needs to take on, not us. Now, stare decisis, I kind of mentioned this a couple of times. This is the idea of let the decision stand, uh, Latin, stare decisis. Uh, and it's the idea of, of looking at precedent, the idea of past history of or cases of uh, what's going on here and basically saying uh, there is a past history or a precedent uh, that we are going to stand by. Okay, uh, Roe v. Wade up to this point uh, since 1973 has been a case in which uh, stare decisis has been ruled. Uh, the court has not gone against uh, that case, and they have basically looked at it and said stare decisis on those cases. If they have taken up the case, uh, for the most part, they have ruled um, that uh, that based on Roe v. Wade, based on um, uh, the the uh, precedent of Roe v. Wade there, uh, they have uh, not ruled in, in other favor. Uh, the, um, the great example was the uh, Texas case, um, there was a Louisiana case, uh, and in all of those uh, they basically um, sided with uh, the precedent in Roe v. Wade uh, to, to not go against that precedent that was established there. So stare decisis is when the court looks at a lower court ruling and says, um, we already have a, a case history here. We already have uh, what the tradition is of the courts in terms, and we're not going to overrule that. We're not going to go against that. Uh, so it really does promote a lot of stability uh, in the courts. It also provides certainty uh, to the lower courts to say, yeah, thumbs up. You did it right. 
uh, and this shows the lower courts, hey, uh, we ruled the way that the court, uh, the, the Supreme Court wanted us to rule on this issue, or the the trial, the district court uh, uh, is is getting a grant of stare decisis on a case from an appeals court, from a circuit court, and that's basically a thumbs up to the district court saying, yeah, you did it right, you um, you argued this case. Uh, and 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 uh, and you did it in a way that we agree with. We're not even going to hear this case. We don't need to uh, because you did it right the first time. So that's stare decisis, a really important action that we see. Now let's talk about briefs. Uh, this idea of amicus curiae briefs or or briefs that the court is going to hear. Uh, these are written arguments uh, for the case. Uh, each side, the the uh, petitioner and the respondent, petitioner, the one that's suing or appealing this case. Um, is going to write the petitioner's um, argument. And then the respondent, essentially the defense, uh, who is, um, is the defendant in this, in this case, of this appeal, uh, is going to write their briefs. And these are basically arguments for the case. They're going to spell out their, their, um, their case in these briefs. And then uh, the justices are going to read these briefs well before uh, the oral arguments. Okay. Now, additional people are going to step in and write briefs. And these are called amicus curiae or friend of the court briefs. Uh, friend of the court briefs uh, are essentially the idea that a, a party, an interest group in a lot of cases, or somebody who uh, is somehow, some way involved in these cases um, uh, indirectly, is going to step in and, and argue why uh, the court should rule a certain way, why they're siding with one side over another. Now, one of the reasons we see interest groups do this is because uh, they want to be on the winning side, uh, and they want to kind of, again, put their thumb on the scale in terms of getting the court to see their point of view. So they're going to step in on, on this uh, because they want uh, the, the Supreme Court to see how they, um, the, the evidence that they have and, and how um, they're trying to win over the court to their, um, to their side of this point of view. Now, oral arguments will be uh, the last piece of this puzzle. Uh, it will be the final piece in which they'll usually hear um, 30 minutes from each side, if you will, uh, the oral arguments. And again, the court can decide they want to hear longer, an hour from each side or, or 20 minutes from each side, but usually about 30 minutes from each side. And, um, and the idea here is each side will be able to outline their case and then um, at any time, uh, a justice can step in with questions and then it becomes a, a free-for-all Q&A uh, with that side only that side, and all nine of the justices. So they can step in with, with questions. Uh, and usually um, it's not, usually uh, they'll give them about two or three minutes to give their opening statement and, um, and then they'll launch into questions. Sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer, uh, but that's usually how it works. And then after 30 minutes, uh, after the petitioner is done, petitioner goes first, the ones who issued the appeal. And then, um, uh, then the respondent will get 30 minutes and the same rules apply. Uh, they'll, they'll get about two or three minutes to, uh, to kind of make their opening case. And then the justices will start in on questions. And then it's really a Q and A back and forth between the respondent and the nine justices until their time is up. There's a little light that goes off, uh, when their time is up. And then the, um, and then the chief justice will say it is submitted and then the case is over and they move on to their next case, uh, if they're hearing another case that day. So that's kind of how, uh, the Supreme Court is in action. Um, we don't get to see those because, uh, there are no, uh, television cameras in the courtroom, but you can listen to them if you go to Oye, O-Y-E-Z, Org. Oye.org has all of the um, the audio versions of these, and if we were in class, we'd be listening to one as part of our uh, Supreme Court uh, moot court case that we would do in class. Um, unfortunately, in the environment we're in, we're not doing one. Uh, but the um, but the idea there is you can still listen to one by looking at uh, by going to Oye.org and hearing some of the. Um, some of the major cases that we've seen over the years. So the opinion of the court, um, this is after uh, the oral arguments, after all of the uh, briefs have been read, the oral arguments have been issued, questions have been answered, um, and it has been submitted. Uh, the opinions of the court uh, break down this way. Uh, the majority opinion is uh, the, the simple majority. So if there are five of the nine members uh, that agree on a particular position, that becomes the majority opinion. Uh, if it is a tie, if there's only eight on the court, uh, and we saw some of this after um, uh, Scalia passed away, uh, Justice Antonin Scalia, um, there was a tie, then what that means is if it is 4-4, then the lower court's decision would stand. And uh, the lower court's decision would stand whatever that may be. Uh, so um, 
there, there is no movement by the court on that particular case. Now, um, the majority opinion is usually uh, written and assigned by the Chief Justice in terms of, uh, they really do divide it up. It's pretty equitable in terms of the number of cases each justice is going to write. And again, they have staff that do this. They have um, clerks that will uh, that are lawyers, uh, many of them lawyers, uh, some of them um, uh, uh, lawyers uh, and, and working for law firms and whatnot, or some of them uh, law school students that are just fresh out of law school. Um, not always the case, but sometimes. Uh, anyway, uh, every every justice on the court will write uh, some type of an opinion along the way. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was was really well known for writing her dissenting opinions, which we'll talk about in a second. But a concurring opinion uh, is uh, now the the assignment by the chief justice or whoever is the the uh, longest serving member of the majority opinion um, would assign who's writing the case, and they would again divvy that up equitably so that everybody uh, over the course of the uh, of the uh, term over the course of the year uh, is writing this about the same amount of, of opinions uh, for the majority opinions. Uh, they can decide to write more if they want to write concurring opinions or dissenting opinions in those cases. Now the concurring opinion is they agree with the majority, uh, but the idea here is that they do it for different reasons. Uh, so I may agree, uh, but I want to outline my reasons for why I agree on this particular matter. Uh, the dissenting opinion, as I mentioned, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, I think the uh, the, the children's book that was that was created for her, somebody gave one to my daughter, uh, was called I Dissent. Uh, and the reason is because she, over the years, wrote a lot of dissenting opinions. Um, this is uh, the opinion of the losing side. So this is that five to four uh, ruling in which the four uh, dissenting judges that voted against uh, the majority opinion uh, basically get to speak their piece and get to, to write the dissenting opinion. So she did write a lot of those over the years uh, because she ended up on the dissenting side of, of some cases that she wanted, really wanted to make her, her opinions and her, her voices of constitutional law heard. And then there's a per curiam opinion. This is the idea that um, it is, uh, it is not uh, necessarily uh, from a particular justice, but it is brief. It is unsigned. Sometimes a per curiam opinion is just the is just the uh, judgment um, and doesn't even have to include an opinion. Um, and it is just uh, the ruling, if you will. So um, that is pretty brief. If there is any type of, uh, of of reason as to why the court ruled the way that they did. Uh, so those are the opinions of the court. Again, the majority opinion uh, is going to be decided by either the chief justice or whoever is the longest serving member of the majority uh, in that particular case. Uh, the concurring opinion, justices can write them but don't have to. And again, uh, this they'd be uh, still siding with the majority but for different reasons and they would want to spell that out. And then dissenting opinion, um, Usually a, a justice will decide to write a dissenting opinion, usually of the remaining justices that, that dissented, excuse me, dissented in the case, um, one would decide to write the dissenting opinion or multiple people want to write a dissenting opinion. They can do that as well. And then per curiam is, like I said, brief and unsigned or uh, brief or unsigned um, or just issuing the the, uh, the ruling without any type of opinion at all. Now, um, looking at... Um, uh, a case in terms of how does it go through this process. Uh, the USV Lopez case is a really great example here of how do you take this um, through uh, the, the process of those courts that we saw. So here, uh, the, the, the case, USV Lopez, actually started in a district court in Texas. Um, the case was ruled in favor, uh, by the U uh, favor of the U.S. by the district court and uh, basically said Congress was in their constitutional right under the Commerce Clause to do this. Uh, and so the district court ruled in favor of the United States in doing so. Now, as you can imagine, uh, Lopez appealed that case and uh, to the Fifth Circuit, which would include Texas in this case. The Fifth Circuit ruled in favor of Lopez. So now you have a, a switch. So the appeals court ruling in favor of Lopez instead of Texas. And they actually said Congress went too far. Uh, that they didn't have uh, constitutional rights under the Commerce Clause to be able to do this because there was no commerce uh, actually being conducted here. And the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case, not because they disagreed with Lopez, but because they wanted to set a precedent here. They wanted to set an established history of uh, the fact that Congress had gone too far in using the Commerce Clause 
to um, to uh, to rule against Lopez in this particular case and and uh, in 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 drafting this commerce clause on gun-free school zones when there's no commerce taking place on school zones, uh, especially having to do with guns. Uh, so the Supreme Court said you've overstepped your boundaries here, and so uh, it basically said to the this this ruling basically giving a thumbs up to the appeals court saying yeah you did the right thing. Uh, again, it's a five to four ruling, uh, so uh, very close one one person. Um, citing the other way would have shifted the case, but it uh, sends a message. It sends a message to the lower course. It sends a message to those appealing cases. Um, it sends a message um, to the Congress that um, you need to take the Supreme Court's constitutionality seriously. Uh, but this is how it worked through that process. So it started in a district court, moved to an appeals court or a circuit court, and then came to the Supreme Court. And I think that's a really good outline in terms of how it works through this federal court system that we see today. So appeals to the court, again, less than 1% uh, of those uh, decisions are actually going to be appealed to the court. Uh, we're going to hear uh, most of those on the district level or even on the appeals level. They're never even going to make it in terms of even being appealed um, uh, to the courts, let alone uh, grant, uh, giving the appeal, let alone granting the appeal. Uh, most of the appeals courts hear cases in bank. Uh, this is usually uh, a, a set of judges. So there may be 17 uh, federal judges that are sitting on a bench in the um, in the Fourth Circuit, uh, but only three of them are going to hear the case in bank. And that is so that they can essentially divide and conquer. Uh, so if you have, you know, 17 judges over the course of a week, they can they can hear many more cases if they're hearing them in, in uh, groups of three or 18 judges, I guess. Uh, to, in six different courtrooms, they can all be hearing different cases all at the same time. Uh, they can move cases through the system much more quickly. Again, they're uh, granting appeals as well. So um, they're deciding whether to hear cases or whether to grant stare decisis, let the lower decision stand. Uh, and in many cases, they do that. There's nowhere to go uh, other than uh, we agree with the lower court. Thumbs up to the district court. You did a good job. Now, can they appeal it to the Supreme Court? They can, uh, but the idea is um, the appeal that chances are the appeals court um, is probably going to be uh, the last line of appeal in that case because the Supreme Court probably won't hear their case if the appeals court didn't. Um, now on constitutional grounds, um, you got to keep in mind that the appeal here is not looking at guilt or innocence. It is looking at whether mistakes were made. Uh, was this constitutional? Was this unconstitutional? Uh, that's what they're looking at here. They're not trying to determine, uh, in a great case, was Gideon v. Wainwright, uh, did he have a right to a lawyer? Uh, they were not looking at whether he was guilty or innocent in terms of did he break into that, uh, that bar's vending machine and steal all the money. Uh, they were looking at did he uh, was he within his legal rights um, to be to be granted a lawyer in which in the case of the district court he wasn't. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, he uh, was not given the rights that procedural he was supposed to be getting. So this is where the court steps in and says, hey, um, these are, this is not constitutional. Uh, he has the right to a lawyer. And if, one, if he can't afford one, one should be appointed to him by the court. And it wasn't. And it should have been. And that's really where the appeals court steps in. Now, that case went back to the courts. Uh, he was granted a lawyer. And he was found innocent. Uh, of that case. They did find out who was guilty and who actually was uh, the um, the person who committed the crime. Uh, but the appeals to the uh, Supreme Court allowed him to get the lawyer, which allowed him to go back and hear the case. Um, they don't look at guilt or innocence. They only look at constitutionality on whether or not he procedurally was granted all the rights he was that he was given under due process of law under the 14th Amendment. So that is the appeal that they heard, and, and that was what they focused on in that case. Now, we see two different uh, schools of judicial philosophy here uh, that you're going to hear a lot about, especially in the next unit when we talk about civil rights and civil liberties. This is the idea of judicial activism and judicial restraint, or what we call loose construction versus strict construction, okay? Uh, loose, act, uh, loose construction or judicial activism is uh, more of a progressive or a liberal point of view on the courts. Um, this is where they're interpreting uh, the Constitution more broadly. Uh, they're applying it to what the, the framers and founders would have thought of, of the Constitution and written it in today's language, looking at it in today's law. Uh, judicial restraint or strict construction uh, is the idea of of a, um, a constitutional um, con constructionist is looking at this in terms of uh, does this violate what the Constitution actually says, word for word. Uh, and so you're going to see um, 
conservatives or, or more um, more conservative uh, judges on the court, justices uh, exercising judicial restraint. Amy Coney Barrett coming from the, uh, as a clerk, she was clerked under Antonin Scalia. And so she is a much more strict constructionist uh, than you would see from Elena Kagan, which is a much more loose constructionist uh, or judicial activist uh, in that capacity. So two very different schools of thought. Um, now, it's important to note uh, that uh, most of the cases that they hear uh, are, uh, are heard and, and ruled on unanimously. It is more the social uh, cases that they hear, more social aspects of the law uh, where they tend to differ and loose and strict construction tend to be uh, how they break down. Um, the... Um, the the uh, the teacher fellowship that I did a couple summers ago, in which uh, thanks to street law, we were able to uh, to go in and and talk to uh, some of the justices. Um, this this is important to note uh, that they said, you know, uh, and I don't remember the exact percentage, but uh, uh, over over a majority of the cases, uh, well over, I want to say like eighty to ninety percent of the cases uh, that are heard by the courts are actually ruled unanimously um, because. Uh, they are, you know, professors of constitutional law. They are uh, scholars of constitutional law. And in looking at this, um, they do tend to come down uh, pretty much uh, in sync on those types of issues. It is only when we look at social issues or social aspects of those issues uh, where ideology and judicial philosophy uh, by party uh, breakdown or by party ideology tends to break them up. And that's where we see a lot of loose construction versus strict construction in terms of their philosophies there. So very different. Now, the question comes uh, with some of the major court cases we've heard over the years. Are they more of an activist or more or, or more uh, judicial restraint? Um, when we look at the idea of um, Brown versus Board of Education, what we see in the center here um, in terms of, of the role that they play, uh, Roe v. Wade over here on the right, and the idea of, of, of the, um, uh, the, the uh, cases uh, with the uh, with birth control in uh, Connecticut, um, in the uh, in the case of uh, Griswold v. Connecticut, uh, the birth control, which established a right to privacy, over on the, the left cartoon here, um, which established a right to privacy, which allowed Roe v. Wade. Without pr the right to privacy under Griswold, you wouldn't have even had a case like Roe v. Wade. And we can even fast forward to uh, the Obergefell case, the same sex marriage case, um, with uh, without right to privacy. Do you have uh, a right to same-sex marriage. Uh, so are these activist cases, are these judicial restraint cases? Uh, again, you be the judge, uh, but they are major court cases and that we've seen a lot in terms of what's happening here. Griswold, as I mentioned, the 1965 case, uh, basically establishing this penumbra of the um, uh, of amendments and provisions of those amendments, uh, including things like uh, the, um, the First Amendment in terms of freedom of speech and um, uh, the idea of the Fourth Amendment, freedom from search and seizure, Ninth Amendment under individual rights, the Fourteenth Amendment uh, in in terms of uh, due process and and uh, equal protection of those rights, um, and uh, the idea here: can an adult talk to someone about uh, getting contraceptives in order to make a private decision about family planning choices? Uh, and the case in the case, uh, this is where the court ruled that um, a right to privacy did exist, even though it doesn't necessarily say that word for word in the Constitution. Now, uh, judicial restraint or strict constructionists would would uh, would argue this there is no such thing. Uh, and Scalia did argue many times uh, with Ruth Bader Ginsburg on that topic. Uh, Ginsburg would say that there was, um, there, there wasn't, uh, there was by reading between the lines of, of, of cobbling together because at that time there was no need for a right to privacy. Um, but based on, on, on what we would look at in those amendments, we can clearly see that there is a right to privacy. This is Ginsburg talking. There is a right to privacy based on, um, these amendments and, and that is where we see it today. Now, Ginsburg and Scalia, uh, were the best of friends. They went to the opera together at the Kennedy Center. You know, they were best of friends. Uh, but judicial, judicial philosophies, very, very different different, very different in terms of their approaches uh, to um, their uh, judicial philosophy. Uh, but this is a good example of a case where we see a more activist or more um, uh, ju loose construction uh, interpretation of the court in terms of what we see here. Uh, so is this legislating from the bench, uh, it being an activist decision? Um, and again, um, is that is that uh, something that we want to see in the courts or not? Uh, you be the judge. Uh, but the idea is uh, that that was 
was seen as um, as really drawing the lines between the two judicial philosophies. Roe v. Wade, again, without that Griswold interpretation, you don't have a Roe v. Wade, you don't have a Burgerfell v. Hodges, uh, you don't have some of the other cases that we've seen here. But this was a landmark ruling on abortion. Now, many say with Amy Coney Barrett on the court, is this going to change Roe v. Wade? Is 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 the um, the shift going to be uh, to, to outlaw it again? Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to be outlawed in the country because it would go back to states' rights and states' Uh, getting to choose whether or not women have the right uh, to an abortion. Uh, but Griswold definitely set the precedent for this case. Um, and uh, that right to privacy really established uh, the, the legal basis, the foundation for being able to talk about uh, this case in the court. And that's what we saw there. Brown versus Board of Education. Um, is there anything in the Constitution that says uh, something about segregated schools uh, and the uh, the idea of, of having those? And the, the court stepped in and said, no, uh, there's nothing in those uh, Constitution that says uh, that schools need to be segregated. So why do we segregate them? Right. And this was a not popular opinion at the time. OK, uh, keep in mind, this was not popular opinion at the time when the court ruled on this. Even the, the president at the time was. Um, essentially uh, quoted as saying something to the effect of, uh, I may not agree with it, but I am charged with enforcing the law and I'm going to enforce it. Um, and so a public opinion was not there yet. Uh, it would take time in order to make that happen. Um, but again, uh, is that loose construction or strict construction in terms of going back word for word, does this say, uh, does this say in the constitution that schools should be segregated? Uh, and, and so uh, it really does help us to understand better those judicial philosophies we're looking at. Uh, in in time and um, and in this one I like it because it also kind of flips uh, the arguments in terms of um, in terms of looking at loose construction and strict construction uh, towards civil rights uh, kind of the flip towards civil rights in terms of well um, it doesn't say in there that schools needed to be segregated uh, and um, and so um, was the Fourteenth Amendment intended to prohibit that school segregation when it was ratified uh, under equal protection? Um, and that equal protection clause would then be used for a lot of other cases that we see, uh, everything from disabilities to um, uh, employment non-discrimination and others in terms of um, in terms of establishing that under the uh, under the Civil Rights Act as well as the Fourteenth Amendment that equal protection clause. So, uh, what are the steps to a Supreme Court decision uh, in looking at this? Uh, the idea is we review appeals. So we have an appeal via the writ of certiorari, a formal petition asking for the case. Uh, there are about 8,000 of those a year, as we talked about. Uh, cases do come from the state Supreme Court or circuit courts of appeals. And sometimes interest groups bring those cases. Uh, the NAACP, the National Advancement for the, uh, excuse me, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, um, brought this case forward on Brown versus Board of Education. Their lead attorney was Thurgood Marshall. He would end up being named to the court, appointed by President Lyndon Johnson. Um, but he argued this case about a desegregation before the court. And it really was an interest group. Because they had exhausted all of the resources, they decided to take the case to court. Uh, they had tried the legal methods. They had tried interest groups. They had tried uh, getting uh, new elected officials in. Nothing was working uh, for their side. And so they took the case to court uh, and, and uh, appealed this writ of certiorari in terms of trying to establish that. So granting writ of certiorari or granting certiorari or granting cert, as we hear in many cases, um, it is... Um, Looking at cases uh, that are constitutional questions, again, not a, a uh, political question. Uh, they're either looking for constitutional questions or a circuit conflict, something where uh, the different courts have ruled in different ways, uh, and so the court needs to step in in order to uh, to do that. Now, you can see here, I love this graphic uh, because it does show how cases start in September or October um, and actually, they're hearing petitions all year round, uh, but the oral arguments will start usually in October, uh, and they will go through um, April or May. Uh, the decisions will start coming down in uh, later in the year, um, uh, like now, uh, through June, and usually they'll finish up by June so they can go and take their summer recess, uh, just like uh, school does uh, with a summer recess and then begin again in October. So that's kind of the, the calendar process for them. But they hear certiorari petitions all year long, uh, and there are resources. Even in the summertime, there are justices that are uh, designated to um, to hear those certiorari petitions, and then if there's any weight to them, uh, to take them to the other justices and get the rule of four uh, kicked in and, and working. Uh, oral arguments, as I mentioned, 30 minutes. Uh, they're standing in front of all nine of the justices, uh, and again, uh, they usually can do that for about two 
or three minutes before the justices will start to interrupt with questions. The Solicitor General, as I mentioned, is going to argue on behalf of the United States government if the U.S. is party to one of those cases. Otherwise, they would not. And the Solicitor General, that really is their role, defending the United States government before the courts, um, and usually it's before the Supreme Court in this capacity. Now, one of the things we haven't talked about, which is how do they decide these cases? Well, this is the room they decide them in. Notice there are nine chairs uh, around the room. Nobody else is allowed in the room. Um, and uh, there are nine uh, chairs around the table. And this is called the Friday morning meeting. And the Friday meeting uh, is essentially where it's just the nine. Uh, there are doors, they are secure, and uh, and allegedly the room is soundproof. Uh, and the idea is uh, that just the nine justices are in here. The newest member is answering the door and serving as the clerk. So if somebody's bringing in lunch or water or breakfast or uh, somebody's knocking at the door, uh, it's the newest justice that's answering that. Uh, the newest justice also, so in this case, it would be Amy Coney Barrett. Um, Bruce Kavanaugh wasn't the youngest, or, or excuse me, uh, w wasn't the, the youngest for very long there. Um, but the idea is that um, they uh, will take notes for uh, the nine, and then everybody around the table um, gets the uh, opportunity to speak on the case before anybody speaks twice. Uh, and there's a really good clip from the National Constitution Center, which I posted on my MCBS classroom, uh, from Justice Breyer uh, talking at the National Constitution Center about how they engage in civil dialogue in this meeting. It's phenomenal because he really talks about how everybody respects everybody else. They are constitutional scholars uh, that, are, that are around this table arguing cases that are going to affect tens of thousands of people's lives, millions of people's lives. I mean, think about the cases they're looking at here, the Muslim ban, um, the, uh, the issues are, uh, on, the, on the border uh, with immigration uh, on the border, uh, as well as um, same-sex marriage or Roe v. Wade. I mean, you can think about all the um, really, um, the, the really big topics that have been covered in this room in Friday conference. Um, so based on this, uh, they will uh, then let everybody speak. They will take a vote on um, on where they are with the nine, and then they will start to assign majority opinion, uh, dissenting opinion, uh, and and kind of go that route based on uh, who's uh, voting on which sides. And, um, and then that may change over time. As they start to look at their opinions and read others, they may change their opinion and may switch, uh, which a majority opinion may end up being a dissenting opinion uh, because of judges, uh, justices that, that uh, switch their, their, their uh, decision. Uh, so that happens. And all of this is done much on paper, uh, but all of this is done in secrecy and private. And as you can imagine, the clerks are held to the highest form of secrecy. Uh, you'd never get a job in a law firm if you were uh, fired from the Supreme Court for, for having violated the, the confidentiality of, of the courts in this capacity. Uh, so then they write the opinions. As we mentioned, the majority opinion becomes the law of the land. Um, it can be as few as five members. It can be as many uh, as a unanimous decision. Um, the concurring opinion is somebody who uh, is giving reasons as to why they voted the way they did, but uh, is agreeing with the majority opinion. And then the dissenting uh, is why they don't agree with the majority opinion in those cases. Uh, and so then uh, whenever the, uh, the opinion is ready, uh, and hopefully the, 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 uh, the end date would be late June, uh, the decision would be announced along with a new precedent that is being set by the court, and, um, and that would be public uh, in, in terms of how that's played out. Hope you found this helpful in terms of the uh, review questions here. Pause the video, take a look at what questions you can answer, and, um, and then we will um, move on from here. Okay, the last section we're going to look at here is 2.11. And this is the idea of checks on the judicial branch, many of which you already know, but a good uh, review nonetheless. What is the proper role of the judiciary? Well, judicial restraint, we talked about this. The idea that um, we are going to... Um, we are going to rule on constitutional questions, not on political ones, right? Um, if there are democratically elected branches uh, that have political questions they need to decide, we're going to let them do it. The gerrymandering cases uh, last year in which uh, Wisconsin and Maryland, uh, basically um, uh, the cases were brought before them saying, does the state uh, legislature have the right to gerrymander in a way that is politically advantageous? And the court said, this isn't a question we can answer because it's not a constitutional one. It doesn't violate the Constitution based on what the, the uh, legislatures did. So we're going to let them do what they do. That's a political question, not a constitutional one. Leave us out of it. 
That's judicial restraint, okay? Judicial activism, uh, this is when the courts are going to step in and overrule other branches, determine that something is unconstitutional. President Trump, your Muslim ban uh, executive order is unconstitutional. That's creating a new policy. It's basically stepping back uh, what President Trump and the executive branch were trying to do there, okay? Um, in ruling that um, Obamacare under uh, under the um, Obama administration was a tax and not um, just a law that people had to, to buy it, uh, that was uh, ruled constitutional. So uh, that underscored uh, the point uh, that the that the um, that the the Congress had the power to be able to do that. Now we'll see to be continued how that plays out. But again, um, judicial activism in ruling uh, in the uh, Brown v. Board of Education case or in the Roe v. Wade case um, is this judicial activism in terms of overruling the other branches uh, when they're not doing something and creating new policies as a result. So uh, a lot of times this is about striking down laws. Um, and especially if uh, we've seen this with gun cases, uh, they trample on the individual rights and liberties of other cases of, of other um, uh, of, of states that are trampling on the rights of citizens uh, in those capacities. And so we see uh, many times they're striking down those raw rules, and that's judicial activism in terms of what we see here. Uh, it isn't, by the way, inherently a liberal or conservative philosophy. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, judicial activism in the Brown versus Board of Education case wasn't a, a liberal or conservative uh, ideology. Um, the idea here was, I mean, we had conservatives that were voting. Uh, it was a unanimous decision by the court in Brown. Um, and so uh, you had conservatives and liberals that were voting um, in this case to overturn uh, the, the, desegregate, or the uh, segregation laws and desegregate schools in that, that capacity. So there could be a number of reasons why they're doing this. One, uh, they've either uh, overruled or ignored precedent. Uh, they may have struck down a law that Congress passed and the president signed or maybe the president vetoed it and they overrode it. It's been uh, ruled unconstitutional anyway. Uh, maybe it's a reinterpretation of a constitutional standard in terms of something uh, that uh, wasn't interpreted uh, in a way that this court uh, agrees with. Uh, and so they're going to relook at that situation and determine whether or not uh, they agree with it. In this case, probably overruling it. Um, if there's a, a social goal that they're trying to achieve here uh, in terms of uh, that motivation, I think Obamacare with trying to provide health care for people was probably a good example of why Roberts uh, voted for Obamacare in that case, um, being a pretty conservative justice, uh, that was pretty surprising to see him come down in that capacity in terms of ruling that it was a tax. Uh, that surprised a lot of people. But it also was trying to achieve a social goal. Uh, and we see uh, that kind of playing out too. Now, uh, the term judicial activism uh, was kind of uh, termed uh, or named by Art Schlesinger, um, who said, a wise judge knows political choice is inevitable. He makes no false pretense of objectivity and consciously exercises the judicial power with an eye to social results. Now, um, again, depending on your judicial philosophy, you may or may not agree with that in terms of whether you want the court stepping in and doing that sort of thing. And again, um, you know, you make that judgment and that opinion uh, based on what you see here, based on what you know. What do you think about that type of situation? And again, if we were in class, that's a debate we would be having, and I wish we were uh, in having that that type of uh, in that type of debate. Uh, that often is called that legislating from the bench in terms of what we see there. But again, um, it all depends on the issue as well in terms of how that comes down. So how should the Constitution be interpreted then? How should we interpret this? Is it a strict construction uh, in terms of what the Constitution says word for word? Or is it a broader construction, a loose interpretation in terms of what we see there? Uh, what would it have meant to the founders and framers to write the Constitution or to interpret it today in 2020? Uh, how would that play out? Uh, this idea of originalism comes into play. What was the framers' intent? Uh, when writing that? What was their actual word for word in terms of how they interpreted that? Uh, and again, um, that uh, tends to be more conservative view on originalism. Uh, the um, progressives or liberals would take a loose interpretation of that originalism, looking at it and saying, well, uh, but fast forward to 2020, what was their intent when writing the Constitution and how would that be applied today? Uh, that isn't originalism. That's more activism in terms of what we see there. So some checks on the court by Congress. Uh, again, the Senate can reject the nominees. We saw this rejection with Merrick Garland. Uh, they didn't even give him a hearing. 
Um, and it does raise the question, if a, a position were to come open uh, and and President Biden, uh, President-elect Biden, uh, were to nominate someone, would the Senate, being Republican, would the Senate uh, hear, conduct a hearing? Uh, would they conduct a hearing and allow one to move forward? They didn't with Merrick Garland. Uh, would they would they with a um, with a, a new uh, nominee with the Biden administration? So to be continued, I, I think we might see that one play out. Who knows? Um, remember, Congress can also uh, adjust the number of judges, uh, number of justices that are on the court, as well as the number of judges in, in each jurisdiction in the uh, circuits. Uh, they can also change the jurisdiction in terms of what cases, what types of cases they can hear in those circuits. Um, Congress can do that. They can also impeach justices and judges. They have. Uh, they haven't impeached impeached uh, justices in terms of removal from the Supreme Court, but judges from federal courts, they have for corruption, uh, um, bribery, and racketeering charges. Uh, they have held hearings. They've been impeached by the House and the trial being held in the Senate. They've been found guilty and removed from office uh, for those roles. Uh, not many of them, uh, but that has happened. Never to a president in terms of uh, removal, conviction, uh, but uh, definitely in terms of impeachment. We've seen three of those now. And then Congress uh, can also initiate an amendment to the Constitution to overturn a decision. And we saw this um, with the uh, Texas v. Johnson case in the 1980s, 1988, uh, in which um, uh, the court stepped in and said burning a flag uh, was was constitutionally protected speech under the First Amendment. Uh, it caused a lot of controversy in Congress. Many members uh, launched in on, um, on on proposed bills to amend the Constitution to protect uh, the flag from from flag burning. It never went anywhere. It would never even made it out of the House, let alone the Senate. Uh, but the idea was there that can Congress do that? They can initiate an amendment or propose an amendment uh, that then if uh, the House and Senate agree would go to the states for ratification. Again, two thirds of Congress three-fourths of states in terms of doing that. Now, how can the president check the courts? Well, the most common is nominations. Uh, the president can nominate people to the court. And uh, again, they're going to be there a long time after that president leaves office. Uh, so that's going to have a significant impact in terms of uh, the role that their, their uh, political philosophy as well as their political ideology can play. The ideas, um, the uh, policy agenda, uh, the political agendas of what we see there. And um, and um, the idea uh, of um, of in terms of enforcement, uh, the um, the executive branch enforces those decisions of the court. Doesn't mean they have to, and it doesn't mean they have to do it with full force. Uh, so, what is the uh, likelihood that a uh, a, a, an executive branch is going to enforce a decision they don't agree with. Well, we saw the Eisenhower example. I don't agree with it, but I'm going to enforce it. That's my job. Um, I'm not so sure we would see uh, the same type of argument today. I'm not. I'm. I'm not so sure that uh, that would uh, play out based on what we've seen. Um, in, in recent administrations. I'm not sure that would necessarily play out. But who knows? To be continued, we will see um, down the road, I'm sure, um, how, how that affects uh, some of the court rulings. Um, and then the political influence um, in terms of public support or disapproval of, of not just a decision, but also a nominee to the court is another way that the president can use the bully pulpit, uh, the media-generated uh, um, tweets and, and other uh, social media devices in order to carry that out. Um, there is a litmus test, um, without a doubt, but it is not an actual test. Uh, it is not a test that they're giving to a candidate. It is more of a philosophy of uh, basically looking at their work and saying, hey, um, I can see based on what you've said in your opinions, in your writings, in your uh, law school uh, papers, in things like that, I can see um, what you have said about particular issues and how you would rule on those issues, how you feel, think, and, and would act on those issues. Uh, so uh, the idea is uh, many people will deny it. Uh, you see the, the case here. I will not appoint any nominees to the Supreme Court who do not uphold a woman's right to choose or the opposite. Uh, many of them say, I do not have a litmus test for office. Uh, we hear this time and time again from candidates along, along the uh, political campaign. Um, but it's not an actual test. Uh, the litmus test is just this. Uh, they can look at what they've written, what they've opined, uh, what they've uh, what written uh, opinions they've they've uh, uh, 
written on, uh, what their track record is on positions, if they've been on the court, what cases they've ruled in. Uh, all of this establishes a litmus test. All of this establishes a paper trail, a, a path, a record of their judicial philosophy. And it's very easy to see how they would vote on, on future issues based on this. Now, it's not 100%. But the idea is you can get a pretty good feel uh, for how they're going to rule uh, based on what you can read and see. And every time a president makes an appointment to the court, they have staff that are reading this around the clock, uh, trying to find every piece of paper, every opinion, every social media comment, every opinion they've written, every judgment they've given um, in order to see how... Um, they are, may potentially rule in future cases. Uh, the last thing you want to do is be um, uh, to, to find the interest groups that support your party and supported your nomination for president uh, to be blindsided uh, because you uh, end up on the court and you're a wild card. You're not the person we thought you were. Um, we saw this with David Souter, George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush 41, actually excuse me, appointed David Souter to the court, and uh, he ended up not being the conservative everybody thought he was. He was much more liberal or moderate, actually, not more liberal, but more moderate to liberal in nature. And um, and so the, the joke was, uh, are you a Souter? Have you been Soutered um, in that uh, are you a... Um, are you a, 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 a judge that is going to rule uh, the way we think you will based on your past writings, or are you going to be a wild card? Are you going to surprise us? And that's where the litmus test really is important. Uh, but again, many of them will deny it um, and, and say, you know, well, we're not going to hold people to a test, but we are going to hold, you know, to their judicial philosophy in this aspect. And that's kind of what we see today. How do we, how does the process work? Well, the president's going to nominate a candidate. The Judiciary Committee in the Senate would review that candidate, would hold a, a confirmation hearing. Uh, once they're done with that hearing, uh, and we saw this with Amy Coney Barrett in October, um, they will then vote and then send their recommendation up or down to the full Senate. Uh, if they are approved, then the, uh, the full Senate would vote on that nomination. All they need now is a majority, 51 votes. Um, that is not thanks to the Republican Party. That's thanks to the Democratic Party uh, because um, the uh, nuclear option in the uh, Senate was uh, to uh, lower the votes on nominees. Um, and it was under Harry Reid, the, the Senate Majority Leader, um, the Democratic uh, Majority Leader at that time, uh, that that um, pulled the push, the nuclear button or nuclear option, whatever the case may be, in order to get federal um, judges on the bench uh, under the Obama administration. So uh, they lowered it to 51 because it was so close in terms of the numbers in the Senate. Um, they didn't do it for Supreme Court nominees. They said uh, it would still be 60 for Supreme Court nominees. And uh, that is where Mitch McConnell did push the nuclear option on the Supreme Court nominees to lower it to 51. Um, but uh, the precedent was already set. Uh, the history uh, was already set by Reed in taking the federal court um, nominees down to 51 already. So uh, we already saw that in play. Now, some other limitations on the Supreme Court as we close this out. Uh, the Supreme Court can't initiate cases. Remember, as I said, uh, they don't go looking for cases. The cases come to them. They determine whether or not uh, the case has standing, whether it is a judici justiciable dispute, and uh, whether or not um, they would agree or disagree with the appeals court ruling. Remember, there's no enforcement power. Andrew Jackson said the Supreme Court has made its decision. I'll let them enforce it, right? Uh, and then public opinion is important here too. So that can limit the Supreme Court. Um, as we can see here, um, people tend to approve the way the Supreme Court does their job. Actually, in approval uh, ratings uh, against the other two branches, Supreme Court always ends up higher, uh, always gets a higher approval rating than the other two. As you can imagine, Congress is the lowest, the president's somewhere in between. Uh, but the idea is people tend to like the way the Supreme Court is handling its job, and their approval rating tends to be higher than the other two branches. Uh, stare decisis is important, and that limits their, their ability uh, to rule on cases if they're letting decisions stand from past precedent from past history of cases that have already been decided. And then obviously the Constitution is going to limit them because they are ruling, uh, they're, they're uh, looking at all of their cases based on the Constitution and its amendments. Uh, and, and that is uh, the severe limitation because they're only ruling based on what they see in the Constitution. And that is, that is their North Star uh, in terms of their, um, uh, their judicial interpretation and philosophy. Hope you found this helpful. Again, uh, at the end here, take pause and take a look at the review questions. And um, I hope you found this to be a, a, an overview, which I know is a long one, but hopefully a helpful one in terms of getting through all the content in this chapter in the judiciary.
Next up is going to be civil rights and civil liberties. I'm so looking forward to this unit and I think you will too. So we'll see you over there. Have a great day.